In this video, we're going to be discussing Gibbs free energy, which is one of the most important thermodynamic variables we need to describe chemical reactions. Gibbs free energy takes into account the enthalpy or our heat measure of our reaction, plus our entropy, our measure of disorder in the reaction, and puts it all together to say, hey, is this reaction gonna proceed forward, aka be spontaneous, or are we going to need outside energy to force it to go forward because really it wants to go backwards, which is non-spontaneous. So let's go ahead and discuss the features of Gibbs free energy and how it relates to our other thermodynamic variables. So starting off, nomenclature delta G is our notation for Gibbs free energy. Josiah Gibbs in the late 1870s-ish uh, came up with this concept that for a given chemical reaction, we can actually calculate its ability to do work or to have work done to it. And this is separate from our pressure volume work where we're increasing or decreasing pressure. Gibbs free energy is really all about being at a constant pressure and temperature. And what we can see is even at a constant pressure and temperature, a reaction can give off energy, can give off and do work to other things, or it can require energy and need some other source of energy, maybe from another reaction, in order for it to proceed. Now this may all sound a little complicated right now, but it's a real fundamental idea to why we have some reactions that occur spontaneously, they just happen, and others need an input of energy in order to go forward. Now remember, as with all deltas, this is our energy in our final state, G final, minus our energy in our initial state, and that's gonna give us our change in G. And this energy is usually calculated in joules per mole. Um, sometimes we'll need to convert to kilojoules per mole to do calculations with delta H, uh, but this is often going to be our unit. So what does delta G mean for a given reaction? If we have a reaction, let's say A plus B drives to C, and it can go backwards or forwards, our delta G will indicate whether or not it's more likely to proceed forward or more likely to go backwards or stay as reactants. And so what's really interesting is our delta G, if it's negative, if it's less than zero, all right, so of negative delta G value, what that means is that we had more energy in our reactants and we have less energy in our final state, which means that we gave off energy. This is called an exergonic reaction. And an exergonic reaction, by definition, is spontaneous. meaning we don't need any external energy source. In fact, it's got plenty of energy so much so that it's giving off energy. It's actually less energy to hold product C than it is to have reactants A and B. Now, if we had delta G being greater than zero, that would indicate an endergonic reaction. In an endergonic reaction, we have more energy in the final state than we do in the initial. And that energy had to have come from somewhere. So that energy needed to be an external energy source in order to drive the reaction forward. So this is what we call non-spontaneous because we need external energy in order to make this forward reaction happen. Another way to say this is that it favors reactants or it's more likely that the reaction will stay as reactants A and B unless we have an external energy source. So there's this big old equation that connects delta G to enthalpy and entropy. And it's as follows. Delta G is equal to delta H or enthalpy minus temperature times delta S or entropy or measure of disorder. And so we want to connect this idea of enthalpy and entropy to delta G and our concept of spontaneity. And so the easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is to make a little chart, because then we'll walk through each example. So let's start with delta H. If we have delta H and delta H is positive, delta H is greater than zero. And we have delta S and delta S is less than zero. So we are endothermic, we're absorbing heat, 
and we are decreasing disorder. We're getting more ordered. If you check that out, a positive value plus a negative, negative times a negative is a positive. So a positive plus a positive, that's going to give us delta G being greater than zero or non-spontaneous at all temperatures. Doesn't matter what the temperature is, these values are always going to give us a delta G of greater than zero, which means it's going to be an endergonic or non-spontaneous reaction, meaning we're going to have to add energy if we want this reaction to proceed forward. Now let's do the opposite situation. Let's say that our delta H is less than zero. We have an exothermic situation. We're releasing heat from our system, from our reaction into the environment. And let's say that our delta S is greater than zero. We are increasing disorder. We are increasing disorder or getting less ordered, whichever you prefer. Increasing disorder, less order. Well, that would be a negative and a positive here. So positive times a negative is a negative. Negative minus negative is going to be a negative. So our delta G, and again, you can put numbers in here if you need to, to, to kind of visualize this, but our delta G here is always going to be less than zero. It's always going to be a negative value, which means with these conditions, exothermic and increasing entropy, we are going to be spontaneous at all temperatures. Doesn't matter what the temperature is, we're going to be spontaneous. Um, and again, for both uh, enthalpy and entropy, write in whatever makes most sense for you. If you're like, I need to think about as positive entropy, increasing disorder, or decreasing disorder, that's fine. If you need to write it as releasing heat for exothermic, absorbing heat, for endothermic, that's fine too, whatever is easiest for you to remember. All right, now let's do a slightly trickier situation. Let's say that our delta H, our, our reaction is still exothermic. All right, so we're still less than zero, we're still exothermic, we're still releasing heat. So negative here, so far so good. But then let's say that our delta S is also less than zero. So we're getting a decrease in entropy or more order, whichever you prefer to learn. Okay, so now what is our delta G? Well, if we have a negative sign here and a negative sign here, negative times a negative is a positive overall. So if a negative and a positive, well, whichever one is a bigger number is going to be what delta G is, right? So if our T delta S wins, if it's a bigger number, we're gonna be positive, we're gonna be non-spontaneous. If our delta H wins, if that's a bigger number, then we'll be negative and we'll be spontaneous. So for these types of situations, I usually like to visualize us as wanting to be spontaneous. Usually it's nice to be spontaneous, not have to need any extra energy. So if we wanted to have delta G be less than zero, what kind of temperature do we want? High temperature? or low temperature? If you said low temperature, you're absolutely correct. Because at low temperature, that means that the delta H value, our negative value, will beat out our negative times negative, our positive value of T delta S. So if this was like negative 100, right, and this was negative 50, if we have a nice low T, like one, <laughs> right, I'm just doing random values here, then this negative 200 is gonna beat out this positive 50. Exactly. So the opposite would be true at high temperatures, right? Delta G would be non-spontaneous at high temp, all right? So uh, spontaneous at low temp only. Cool, right? Let's do the last one together. I'm sure you can see the pattern now, so feel free to jump ahead. We have our delta H being endothermic, greater than zero absorbing heat, our delta S being greater than zero, increasing entropy, getting more disordered. So what's going to win here? Well, we have a positive value for delta H, that would mean non-spontaneous, but we also have a positive value for delta S, which overall for T delta S would mean a negative value based on the equation. So what temperature do we need to have T delta S win? A bigger T, right? So 
delta G being less than zero will happen at high temperatures. Delta G being greater than zero, non-spontaneous, would happen at low temperatures. So spontaneous here, only at high temp. Now remember, our delta G values are usually at a consistent temperature and pressure. So whatever the experiment was done is what we'll use to actually calculate. So if they tell you that the temperature was 20 degrees Celsius or 290 Kelvin, right? We would use that value to calculate um, and then determine our delta G from there. Uh, but conceptually, now we also know what we're looking for in terms of temperature. Now this is interesting, right? And you might be like, that's so weird, but this is actually what's happening with phase changes. With phase changes, as we go from a solid to a liquid, we're both um, absorbing heat, so positive endothermic for delta H, but we're also getting more disordered. So we're positive for delta S. So as we go from solid to liquid, we're in that last category here um, where we're both going up in entropy but also going up in enthalpy. And so whether or not that will happen spontaneously depends on the temperature. And our water glass here, we can see that I have my glass of water with ice in it. It is, as it's sitting here, it's getting more and more liquid. This is spontaneously happening because it's at a high enough temperature. Our ambient temperature here of about 27 degrees Celsius is a high enough temperature for this to happen spontaneously without any extra energy on my part. Now, one final thing here, what happens if delta G is equal or really close to zero? Well, that just means that we are at equilibrium. That means here that we are perfectly balanced and we're not driving forward or moving backwards. And we're sitting there at a equal amount of reactants and products in this nice dynamic equilibrium or steady state conditions. In terms of notation, just in case you see it um, as you progress through practice questions, you can see delta G like we did here. You can also see delta G naught. This just means standard conditions, all right? This means standard laboratory conditions. Remember I said that delta G is usually calculated at a constant temperature and pressure. These standard conditions are 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure on average. And then if you see this notation, little uh, not and then a little prime here. That means physiological conditions. So the major addition there would be these would be reactions happening in our bodies and we're taking them in the conditions in our bodies. Usually also pH is a factor there of 7.4 in our body system. So I don't want you to stress too much about what these mean. These are just saying, hey, here's the conditions in which we're doing the experiment. And these can often show up on delta H and delta S as well. And it's really just to say, hey, this all happened at standard conditions. And since standard conditions is 25 degrees Celsius, you now know, oh, I know the temperature of this particular uh, reaction. And if you know the temperature and they give you delta H and delta S, you could calculate the value of delta G. Remember, check your units. If they give you Celsius that asks you to convert in Kelvin, definitely convert to Kelvin, uh, but that allows you to do those calculations as necessary. And that was Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy comes up over and over and over again. One last important point that I just wanna say before we wrap up this video is that remember that Gibbs free energy is a thermodynamic concept. It's not kinetic. So for example, Carbon, going from carbon as a diamond to carbon graphite is a spontaneous process. It has a negative delta G, but it happens super, super, super slow because our activation energy is so high. Activation energy is a kinetic concept, which means that in order for this to proceed, it needs to overcome that activation energy and it takes forever. That does not change the fact that it is a thermodynamically favorable reaction because it does not require an outside input of energy. So I know it's tempting to conflate like the concept of catalysts moving a reaction faster with Gibbs free energy and spontaneity. Those are separate ideas. Spontaneity has nothing to do with the presence or absence of a catalyst. Catalysts do not affect spontaneity or delta G. I hope this video is helpful and I'll see you in the next lesson.